Welcome back. This is the plenary discussion, Protecting Children on the Move, Within and Across Borders. Welcome back. I was so delighted when I was asked to facilitate this discussion. And then over the past two days, I became incredibly excited as well. There have been so many great discussions in the thematic panels, the interactive discussions, on the sidelines. And now we're going to bring it all together with all of you. Come on in, grab a seat. I'm just going to say a few words to frame our discussion and then really hand over the time to our panel and a discussion with all of you in the room. So let me do that quickly. My name is Tasha Gill. I am the Senior Advisor for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action at UNICEF. You don't hear me very well? Ooh. So let me say that again. Welcome back. <laughs> My name is Tasha Gill. I'm the Senior Advisor for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action at UNICEF headquarters in New York. I am a proud member of the Alliance. I am also co-lead of the Alliance. And as I was saying, apparently very quietly earlier, I am incredibly excited to be opening this panel. Um, I'm just gonna say a few words to frame the discussion and then really hand over to our four panelists um, to take us through their reflections and then open up for discussion Please think about everything you've been hearing and sharing over the past day and a half. Listen to our panelists and then join in the discussion about where we are headed as the Alliance. Um, so thanks again for joining. I find it's incredibly important that we decided to prioritize this topic um, at the annual meeting this year, that we're holding the annual meeting this year, the first time in person in what feels like ages, here in Panama, in this region, talking about children on the move. It could not be more pertinent here in the region and globally. It is the year for us to be talking as Child Protection and Humanitarian Action about children on the move. I'm going to just start with a few framing, pulling back from our background paper, some of the framing comments from yesterday morning, opening the session, reminding us of the global scale of the phenomenon of children on the move, and knowing that human mobility can bring many benefits for children and their families. Safety, access to services, reunification with families, and at the same time, we know that irregular mi migration and some of the harrowing journeys of displacement can put children and families at great risk, at incredible harms, facing all of the child protection concerns that we know across contexts. And for that reason, it's important that we take stock and hear again, 43 million children displaced due to conflict and violence in 2022. And let's break that down. 17 million children in need of international protection who had crossed borders, 25 million displaced in their own countries. Let's add to that one of our other topics for this annual meeting, which is climate. We know that 95% of new displacements caused by conflict are also happening in countries that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. In fact, Every day for the past four years, extreme weather events exacerbated by climate change have forced more than 20,000 children from their home every day. It's huge. Another aspect, one that those who have been in the same room with me would have heard that I raise again and again, is the issue of children who are deprived of their liberty because of their migration status. There are at least 80 countries that have laws that allow children to be detained based on their migration status. And at least 330,000 children globally per year are deprived of their liberty based on their own migration status or that of their parents. And this is probably an under count. It's probably much higher than that. We also know that displacement is increasingly protracted. Most children who are displaced now will spend their childhoods being displaced. So our focus is also on solutions. 
We've been talking about the migration routes, the human mobility routes, um, over these two days, Latin America and the Caribbean, and the perilous journey through the Darien Gap. Also, the Mediterranean route from North Africa into Europe, the South Asia routes. But also, we know that people are traveling around the world to go through these routes. It's not only region-specific. People are arriving from Asia into Central America, moving towards the US. I remember when there was the outflow of refugees fleeing the war in Ukraine who were arriving in Mexico to go into the US. It is a global phenomenon and a child protection phenomenon. And because it is a child protection phenomenon that I want to highlight for our discussion today, just to remind us that we have all of the child rights foundations and frameworks that enable us and empower us to engage in this. We have international legal frameworks, refugee law, international humanitarian and human rights law that enable us to engage on this. The guiding principles on internal displacement all speak to the protections of children. And the Convention on the Rights of the Child ensures that all children's rights are protected for all children at all times. And with states having an obligation to uphold and ensure those rights, we need to focus on those who are not benefiting from those rights in law or in practice. Many children in the context of human mobility are excluded from enjoying the same rights as children in the host countries. So with that then, we as child protection actors are focused on those inclusive child protection systems working with government and civil society in order to be able to ensure that children have access to protection and services. We're doing that in all contexts and as CPHA in humanitarian contexts. What about the children who are still moving? Children who are on the move? How are we working with them? The focus of today's discussion is on the programmatic work, the practice, the experience, and what we can do to support that. Mm -hmm. So with that now, I'd like to move over to our discussion. Our goal as CPHA is that inclusive systems provide protection for children on the move, including while they are mobile. We work with institutions, partnerships, capacities to deliver this, and yet the challenges and the risks are important. They are significant. What is different about our child protection work in this context? What promising practice and learning can be adopted and adapted to scale across contexts? And with that, then I'd like to now turn over to our panel and introduce our panel members. Thank you so much, panel members, for joining us. I'm going to start from my far left. Khadiga Al-Sharif is a community psychologist currently working as the Child Protection Advisor at Child Fund International's US office. With 13 years of experience, she supports child protection and mental health and psychosocial well-being programs across more than 20 countries in Asia, Africa, and the Americas. She focuses mainly on community-based child protection, MHPSS, and online safety. To her right, we have Severine Lacroix, who works for IOM Geneva, on humanitarian protection and child protection, where she provides tailored support to country teams. Severine previously worked with several INGOs on protection, child protection, human rights, and access to justice in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. To her right, we have Marina Capriola, who currently works as, for UNHCR as Senior Protection Officer, where she provides strategic guidance on child protection, gender-based violence, community-based protection, and education for refugees and asylum seekers in the Americas. She has 23 years of experience mainly on asylum, international protection, and solutions in Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Americas. And to my left here, Rocio Aznar has worked internationally in the field of child protection for the last 17 years. She has worked at UNICEF, UNHCR, Human Rights Watch, and the International Federation for Human Rights across Africa, Latin America, Europe, and Southeast Asia. She has worked in both development and humanitarian settings, including natural disasters, armed conflict and armed violence, and migratory, refugee, and displacement contexts. She is currently the Chief of Child Protection for UNICEF Mexico. 
welcome to all the panelists. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. The idea for our plenary today is I will ask each one of our panelists a question. They will respond about seven or eight minutes and then we will open up for discussion with everyone in the room and we look forward to hearing from you your reflections, thoughts and ideas. So with that then, let me begin. Rocio, please tell us about the benchmarks of inclusive child protection systems and what has worked to develop inclusive systems in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question and for the invitation. Um, so let me answer it with some visual support, but it's not really a presentation um, to really discuss and share with you what are the methodologies we're um, using in Mexico with the government of Mexico um, to make the child protection system more inclusive um, to children on the move and what has been our common strategy and how it is going so far. Um, um, two uh, pieces of preliminary information just for all of you, those of you that are not that familiar with the context in Mexico, we do have the largest land border in the world between the US and, and Mexico at our northern border. Um, you can see here the numbers of last year. We have over 700,000 uh, movements, let's say, identified the Mexican migration uh, authorities, including over 100,000 um, children, uh, out of which over 6,000 were uh, unaccompanied. And that meant at least a 30% increase in comparison of children on the move in comparison with the previous um, year. And really, we've seen an increase in children every year um, traveling with their families and uh, decreased last year but only last year of unaccompanied children so that's one very important piece of information on the context um, also um, that um, since 2014 the country has quite a solid uh, legal framework and, and we do have a child protection system uh, and authorities in place a child protection authorities so um, and they are in charge of two main, um, um, uh, let's say, responsibilities. One is determining the best interests of any child that is has a child protection concern. And the second one is representing legally in any um, administrative or judicial matter that involves the child. And that's very important. This seems, that looks quite impressive. We have over 2,500 child protection authorities. At, uh, we have a federal level, we have a state level, we have 32 states in the country. It's a very um, large country, very highly populated, and at municipal level. Despite you seeing so many in the country, still we have areas that are remote um, and that have also issues of humanitarian, even humanitarian access due to situations of armed violence, as we've been saying. So these are the two pieces of information. Now, in response to your question about um, how are we measuring the level of inclusiveness of the child protection system in Mexico, which is um, uh, relatively young, since 2014, uh, child protection authorities are in place. Um, so we are using two uh, basic global tools. The first one is UNICEF uh, Child Protection System Strengthening Benchmarking Tool, which is a global tool that defines what are the seven domains that are determined um, we need to work on to be able to strengthen the system. And why we're using this um, um, tool is because if we don't strengthen the child protection system per se to any child, there's no way we can make it inclusive because it won't have the capacities to attend children on the move. So we need to make sure first and foremost um, that the child protection system has sufficient capacities to attend any child in need, including children on the move. Um, so there are seven domains, basically is the legal um, and policy environment, the coordination, the continuum of services, uh, for it to have the sufficient budget, the personnel, the data system, um, and also ensure that there's oversight, external oversight, uh, looking into the functioning of the child protection system and child there's a mechanism for child participation. And we assess the level of development of uh, over 140 countries in the world based on this global benchmarking tool. 
Um, so we did a first um, very rapid evaluation of where we thought Mexico's child protection system was in 2021. And you can see here what our uh, very rapid evaluation. There are four stages of development uh, from system building, system enhancement, system integration, and the highest level system maturity. And then we uh, basically, if the country uh, meets certain requirements, you can pr give uh, credits or points. Um, and then we determined that it was at the second level, the second stage. Um, and that was in 2021. We adopted a strategy with the Federal Child Protection Authority, whose chief is present here. We have that fortune um, uh, this week um, with key priorities. And we started implementing them in order to um, help the country jump to the next level. And according to by 2020, um, basically 2023, we already jumped at the federal level. This is a national overview to the third level, really selecting carefully the interventions that were more strategic and that would help the, the system really um, get stronger. Now, we also, and by 2025, we predict that the system will be close to the fourth level at the national level. That doesn't mean that the 32 states are at that, that, uh, are at that level. We need to have a, a similar process for each state uh, because the situation may vary uh, quite, quite significantly. Now, we use a second, um, let's say, tool, global tool, to assess then how inclusive it is then for children on the move. The first one is telling us how strong our system is to attend any child in need. But the second tool is telling us, OK, how inclusive it is to children on the move. And then we're using, along with UNHCR, also my colleague present here, uh, a UNICEF UNHCR tool, which is a, an inclusivity indicator of refugee children in this case. Uh, so we did, uh, we used that tool together jointly and we assess where the country is. And in this case, there are three indicators or sub indicators that are looked at. First one is um, to what extent children the move access the child protection services. Uh, the second one is to which ex extent they access child justice services. And the third one is about birth mm -hmm. registration. So the, these three categories. And then we concluded, in fact, that as you can see um, in, in the, in, there, in the, there are four stages. Either you're not inclusive, your system is not sufficiently inclusive, fairly inclusive, or inclusive. And we determined that we are two points away to be able to say that the Mexican system is fairly inclusive. But the conclusion really um, shed light uh, where the gaps are mostly and it's about the justice system the access to the justice system but also social protection in general um, so this beyond um, the level uh, where we position the country and the child protection system what is important is that it is a framework that gives us the possibility to really strategically select the interventions that we think will move the needle and along and in partnership with the government who is at the driving seat and is leading this process. So these are the key areas where we've been working together with the government in support of the government, UNHCR and UNICEF, um, to make the system stronger for any child in need and second, inclusive to children on the move. So first of all, you can see here legal reform. Legal reform was key. Uh, something extremely hap uh, important happened uh, in 2021, at the beginning of 2021. Uh, we've been saying it during this uh, week, is the legal amendments to the migration law and to the asylum law. So Mexico, I think quite um, proudly, uh, reformed its law so that it ended a detention, migration detention of children and their families. Second, very important, it the responsibility over the children on the move moved from the migration authorities to the child protection authorities, extremely important. And then it uh, recognized and uh, granted legal status to children on the move, including their families. So these are really very important steps forward. Then 
along with the legal framework, um, we've been working in basically um, reform and also the policy framework. So in 2019, um, the country we supported the country to adopt a, a cross-sectoral protocol, uh, really um, clarifying what each authority need to do when there is a child on the move that has been identified from the migration authorities, the child protection authorities, the welfare authorities or the care authorities are also very important. Along with that, we are working on strengthening the local coordination. Um, so we are really working uh, with civil society and the federal authorities in establishing state um, mobility, child mobility commissions that are in charge of adopting local plans to strengthen the inclusion uh, and the attention to children on the move. We're also working on the case management. It's really very important. And the, something we realized to start with is, and this is how interconnected are uh, all the efforts we do to strengthen child protection systems with the efforts we do uh, to make them inclusive. Because uh, the country did not have a harmonized national case management protocol. And that was, to start with, indispensable to be able to provide better in quality services to children from or by the child protection authorities. So now we are about to finalize with the federal child protection authorities the first national child protection case management harmonized for the whole country, standardized. And that is really key to make sure services are uh, harmonized and the quality is more standardized uh, throughout the country and the practices as well. And it has a specific chapter on mobility. Um, the other one is advocating for increased resources for the child protection authorities. Already before the um, uh, legal amendments of the law in 2021, where basically the demands um, toward the child protection authorities increased, including children on the move. Before that, child protection authorities were already um, operating uh, below 27% of the budget they needed before the legal reform. Now, now the uh, population that now they need to attend has increased exponentially with the children on the move. So imagine the level of budget allocations, public budget allocations they have. It's really not sufficient to the level of services and the requirements they have. So we are working and supporting the uh, uh, child protection, federal child protection authority to um, um, conduct a diagnosis of needs, financial and human resources needs for them to be able to attend. And based on a category or profile of different child protection authorities. Do we have child protection authorities uh, at border areas that have certain needs um, because of the children on the move? We have uh, child protection authorities in urban areas where you have all the types of violence and all types of needs, or child protection authorities are in places highly affected by armed violence, by organized, cri organized crime, and then you have all the needs. So that will be hopefully uh, finalized uh, in August to be able to influence the next uh, federal government in increased allocations of budget. That assistance, we had a specific session on that. So um, now for the first time, Mexico has a national registry on child protection, including a registry on children on the move. Now with one voice, the government of Mexico can say how many children on the move that have been um, identified and registered and provided with child protection measures and how many of them are in institutions or in, or in foster care. And that takes me to the next level. And this is, don't worry, sort of the last one, um, is alternative care for unaccompanied children. And um, even though the law already ended detention, let us not forget that if a child is unaccompanied in Mexico in so many other countries, um, Thankfully now, the child is under uh, the custody of the state, of, the, of the, the government, hence placed under the alternative care system. But in a country such as in Mexico and in, largely in Latin America, the only solution is an institution, is residential care. And residential care for most of the children in Mexico, Mexican children in need with deprived of parental care, is very much closed doors. So the children are really, um, they're not much freedom of movement already for any child in the residential care in Mexico. So if we want to improve the situation of children on the move in the care 
um, system, we need to reform the care system to start with. Nobody will make an exception for children in the movie. They, we don't make the exception for all the children, including the Mexican. So we are working very closely with the federal child protection authorities to reform it, increasing the number of alternative options. So we already have foster care programs open to migrant children, children on the move, which is great. And we also are improving the standards of residential care so that we can transform the model where the children live. And then finally, durable solutions. Um, until very recently, the only uh, measure taken was return without much of a look on into the history of the child, is it safe, is it in the best interest. So we are working on increasing the options, including reunification in the US, thanks to this, and it's just a picture, this MOU between Mexico and um, the US signed on 16 January 2023, allowing for a coordinated um, reunifications and relocation for unaccompanied children in Mexico into the US, which is quite historical. And just two more <coughs> pictures, which these are the national guidelines on alternative, on foster care for children on the move and on residential care for children on the move approved by the government with support from the agency. So I'll leave it here. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you so much for that great case study. inclusive systems that protect all children. Um, and you mentioned several times partnership. I'd now like to turn to Marina to talk about partnership and complementarity that are perhaps more vital in children on the move work and cross-border programming than anywhere else. Why is that and what is your experience, Marina? Thanks a lot, Tasha, and also thanks a lot, Rocio, because she somehow introduced my subject of partnership, partnership with UNICEF, partnership with uh, some of the organizations that are here, partnership with our donors. Uh, so when we were discussing with Tasha about uh, this question, I reflected how I can structure to make it meaningful in a forum that is about partnership. So it's the Alliance is the most important place for partnership for child protection. So I'm going to structure my intervention around uh, maybe two areas. What's the role of partnership and how it's helping us? And uh, what's, the, what's the role of the Alliance on partnership, how they can help uh, the members and uh, the other actors? And I'm going to conclude with a short video of a concrete example of partnership. So let's start with partnership. Maybe I'm saying things that all of you are thinking about when we talk about partnership, but definitely the basic why we use partnership is, let's be frank, to fill the gaps. None of us can do one thing or everything. So we are trying to build on comparative advantages, some of us is specialized on uh, refugee protection. Some of us is, uh, is specialized on mental health. We join forces and uh, we definitely avoid duplication. We avoid that we are using the money not in the best way. And I know that there is after a session uh, with, uh, with donors. So I think this is definitely the, the first thought that we would have when we're thinking about partnership. But then if we go a little bit more into uh, reflecting a bit further, then it's the shared experience that we are having together with, uh, with the other partners, no? We have maybe some ideas and practices together. We improve the, the practice. So the element of uh, sharing expertise for children on the move, it's crucial. We see that children are moving along some routes, they are arriving in some places, maybe they received some services before they would expect to find services that have the same standard. The, the third and last point that I was thinking in terms of general role of partnership, it's about the advocacy that we're doing together. So when we are delivering services together, uh, we are in concrete doing uh, advocacy, our collective voice is stronger than our singular voice. And uh, we can definitely, for instance, advocate for child-friendly procedure in the asylum. UNHCR has the mandate on that, but then when we join forces with UNICEF and with other actors, definitely the, mas the message is coming stronger. So 
that's a little bit what I was thinking when I was asked to cover about uh, what's the role of partnership. And then we tried to make a step forward and thinking about uh, what role would we expect from the Alliance and what could be some of the ideas, but also I'm happy to hear from the others during the Q&A session to add on my list of uh, possible things. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would think that the Alliance could be a hub for uh, knowledge, a uh, knowledge hub. So a place where uh, we have a central platform for sharing best practices on children on the move, uh, for sharing, for instance, what's happening in the Americas. You know that we're doing so much because the entire population or a, a big part of the population, definitely not the entire, but many of the children are on the move. How do we share it with people working in the Mediterranean, that maybe they're f facing very similar challenges. And can we share it even in Asia? Is it relevant? So uh, having the Alliance as a, a knowledge hub would definitely uh, support children on the move. Uh, and related to uh, a joint uh, a, a knowledge hub, definitely having uh, joint training uh, on children on the move, sharing these experiences and these practices uh, can be uh, an added value for, for the Alliance. So everybody could be uh, at a similar level. Uh, and uh, also I think I was thinking about conveying power. So how can we bring together, like today, bring together so many people uh, that are sharing a common goal and fostering dialogue, fostering collaboration. So this is definitely something that uh, the Alliance is already doing with, uh, I see, with a lot of participation from everybody. And again, the role of the Alliance, uh, I understand, is a lot about uh, advocacy. Uh, as I was saying before, we do it in at the local level, joining together our voices, but definitely having it at the regional or at the global level can be powerful. And finally, I can imagine the role of the Alliance in uh, mobilizing resources. Uh, we are in a, in a very critical moment. However, having a forum where we can share can bring uh, a, a lot of additional value where you can see faces of those who are putting a lot of uh, uh, work in uh, what, what they're doing, a lot of efforts. So these are some of the things that we were reflecting with, uh, with Tasha when we were discussing about what we can share uh, with colleagues on uh, increasing partnership and the importance of partnership. So let me conclude with how do we transform what I said very theoretically and very briefly, actually, uh, today, uh, how we transformed it into a concrete example of partnership. And I hope my colleagues uh, at the back are going to help me with the video that we prepared. So I'm going to share a video about uh, how we're doing partnership in Guatemala. Uh, it's the experience of the Capmirs, for those who are working in the context, is a place where uh, units are together with their partners and together with the government. This is the added value, this is definitely the difference with other uh, realities across the world, how we are uh, providing services to uh, children on the move in uh, Guatemala. Thanks a lot. <laughs> CAPMIR forma parte de una alianza estratégica con el gobierno de Guatemala y el apoyo de la Agencia de Naciones Unidas para los Refugiados, ACNUR, y sus socios. En los centros CAPMIR lo que buscamos como ACNUR es proveer servicios a las personas que están en movilidad humana. Personas refugiadas, aquí en Guatemala, ACNUR lidera cinco CAPMIR. Están ubicadas estratégicamente en fronteras de entrada fronteras de salida. Tenemos un carnet en el Cipulas, Agua Caliente, uno en el Cinchado y Zabal, en Pequé, en Huevo y Penago, y aquí en la ciudad de Guatemala también tenemos un carnet. Esta estrategia busca adaptarse a las necesidades de cada contexto, servir a las comunidades de acogida y articularse con las instituciones locales. El trabajo coordinado por nuestros socios y organizaciones gubernamentales nos ha permitido brindar servicios básicos como información y orientación, asistencia prehospitalaria, conectividad y telefonía, asistencia psicológica, kits de alimentos y de higiene, entre otros servicios. 
El trabajo coordinado con el gobierno y las municipalidades ha sido fundamental para la apertura y el funcionamiento de CAPMIR. Este modelo surge a partir de un acuerdo entre los gobiernos de Guatemala y los Estados Unidos de América para la atención de personas en movimientos mixtos, personas con necesidad de protección y personas retornadas. Somos parte de Ciudades Solidarias y apoyamos el CAPMI, reconociendo esa importancia de recibir a las personas refugiadas a través de estos proyectos de integración. El éxito de los CAPMI se debe a la coordinación y trabajo conjunto de los socios de ACNUR para garantizar la identificación y referencia de personas según sus necesidades. De esta manera se reducen los riesgos y se apoya a las personas con necesidades de protección. La estrategia de trabajo en Ascarmil es articular con las demás instituciones priorizando la atención a aquellas personas que quieren solicitar asilo y protección internacional. Como ACNUR, lo que realmente buscamos es que esos carmines representan para esas poblaciones una esperanza lejos del hogar. ACNUR Guatemala reafirma su compromiso con la protección y atención humanitaria de la población en movilidad humana, refugiada y sus comunidades de acogida. Este programa se ha realizado gracias al financiamiento del gobierno de Estados Unidos. Excellent. Thank you, Marina. Thanks very much for sharing also that example with us with the video. You talked about some of the ideas you have. You mentioned also, um, you know, sharing practices and training. Sabrina, I'd like to turn to you now on a related question, which is about the competencies and skills that you as IOM are investing in to deliver protection services for children on the move. Over to you, please. Uh, thank you for inviting me as well. Um, to complement, uh, so um, in terms of uh, uh, joint initiative, um, I can also mention, uh, so it's also linked uh, the, the, in the region, I can also mention the F4V, uh, the Regional Interagency Coordination Platform for Refugees and Migrants for Venezuela. Uh, led by UNHCR and IOM and addressing the Venezuelan migration crisis in Latin America and the Caribbean. They have a subsector uh, focusing on children and adolescents. Um, there is also an interesting uh, initiative that was developed uh, with, um, between IOM and UNHCR as well, uh, focusing on the central Mediterranean route, uh, Mediterranean route, sorry, um, that covers Western Africa, uh, Eastern Africa with um, all of Africa and Yemen, Northern Africa and Italy. And um, really here, um, this is how we can um, put in practice uh, the route-based approach. Uh, so um, we try to see uh, what strategy we can build together to respond to um, uh, all the challenges that we will face uh, if uh, we are um, uh, children on the move. Um, so it's starting, but I guess this is good initiative that can be also um, developed with other partnerships to reinforce uh, the, um, the action of uh, humanitarian actors in this field. I'm not sure if the sound is good. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> Um, we have also developed guidance with UNICEF on children on the move in the context of climate change, uh, notably, um, but other efforts are ongoing with INGOs, so um, we try to build uh, joint efforts. Um, but we have seen many initiatives also uh, during the last days, so uh, it's interesting to see how we can also continue and improve this cooperation. I guess uh, we have a lot to do. Um, in the response for refugees and for migrants as well. So we have a lot in common uh, for the assistance uh, uh, on the route, uh, even though the status is different, of course. Um, uh, responding to the needs of children uh, on the move um, in terms of skills and competencies, it's huge. We have a lot uh, to bring in this response. Um, so. 
Uh, in terms of coordination with relevant stakeholders, uh, with a focus on localization, community-based uh, um, protection, advocacy, capacity building, uh, capacities to develop a solid child protection programming aligned with the CPMS, CP case management, best interest procedure, PSS, legal aid, counter trafficking, among other professional expertises. It's a lot. Uh, children participation is also key, and you mentioned it in the different uh, sessions. Um, to be able to deliver services for children on the move all along the route, we will need to uh, provide information, first of all, on the services available and develop key messages. Uh, to um, on risk uh, um, present on the route, um, to be able to identify or recognize the most vulnerable, notably unaccompanied and separated children, other children uh, with specific needs and uh, or at risk and orientate them safely to relevant services. Um, this require, uh, requires having uh, up-to-date service mapping, referral pathway in place, and providing adequate training also to be clear on the roles, the responsibilities, and uh, how to avoid causing harm. So this will require um, each time uh, to develop systems uh, with uh, the use of tools and guidance. Um, this requires um, as well to um, be able to develop services all along the way. Uh, in terms of specialized services, of course, we have what we have uh, Access to basic services, yes, as um, MHPSS, educational support, we need to work with very closely, as well as solid uh, child protection case management teams, access to legal assistance and civil documentation, dedicated services for unaccompanied and separate children, that includes family uh, trusting and reunification, uh, alternative care. Um, and that required having clear protocols in place to be able to go through the best interest procedure and uh, when required, the best interest determination with the relevant actors. Again, we need to have all that in place um, and, that, uh, and we need to anticipate all those uh, needs. Um, all these leverages uh, should be used to access the most vulnerable so we can use uh, what help desk in key strategic points all along the route, transit centers, hospitals, distribution point uh, at the border, very important as well. Uh, Helplines, static and mobile teams with integrated services. Uh, for example, for IOM, we have uh, tried um, mobile teams uh, with uh, health, MHPSS, and child protection. Um, just to give this example. Um, but in order to do all that, we really need to work closely with the Child Protection National System, of course, local authorities, local organization, and we need to provide uh, support to reinforce these uh, capacities, uh, depending on the needs, of course, um, including at border for protection sensitive entry system and also referral mechanism to uh, child protection services. Uh, we need to advocate, we mentioned that as well, on the best interest of the child, uh, also alternative to detention, uh, family unity to avoid separation. Um, all this requires as well uh, expertise. Um, again, uh, we need to work with other sectors. We have seen that with a tool uh, working across sectors. Uh, it's important uh, because we need to be able to deliver quality services. Uh, timely uh, and in complementarity. The other sectors, they will, they will help to reduce the risk, um, to disseminate information, and to refer safely to CPS. I will mention uh, the fact that we need to regularly monitor and assess uh, without causing harm to inform the response, uh, guide strategies and advocacies, um, and we need as well information management officer to, to have a clear uh, and up-to-date uh, child protection analysis on the risk. Um, so all that requires as well to have capacities. Uh, often we do it ourselves, case workers are going on the field. Uh, I mean, it's not enough. We need to have capacities, uh, budget to do that. Um, what else? Uh, yes, we should not forget that um, the non-protection uh, actors, they also need uh, minimum capacities to mainstream child protection, uh, to integrate uh, safeguarding measures, 
uh, and um, to mitigate the risk. And that often we don't really budgetize it. So it's really important to think that they need to be trained, uh, they need to receive proper trainings on this topic, and they need also to be able to integrate it in the design of their, project, their program. Uh, what we try to do in IOM is really to work with them closely, uh, to give them the tools, the information, uh, to integrate it in these uh, project proposals. Uh, we try also to have it funded with a kind of uh, um, proportional funding. It's actually, uh, we take percentage of mm -hmm. each sector to fund uh, this aspect of production mainstreaming at the mission level. So this is why at our country office, sub-offices, we try to put that in place with this fund. Uh, and then, of course, each sector is responsible of doing, implementing this child protection mainstreaming and when needed to require the services of child protection actors. Um, I think I, Thank I covered you. all. <laughs> Thank you so um, much, Severine. Yes, just one element and I, just to link with your <laughs> subject, uh, just mentioning that all that requires a budget and uh, often uh, these are uh, mostly human resources, and uh, obviously we have um, we struggle to get uh, fundings to cover those type of costs, and uh, it's a constant negotiation as well with donors to be able to um, fund uh, all the um, all the stuff that we need if we want to be aligned with the standards. So this is something that they need to take into account also. <laughs> so I, I give Thank you the you. floor. Thank you so much. Thanks for mentioning also the standards as well as the risks and mitigating harm. Let's turn now to Kadiga and ask her to speak to us about the risks and challenges that these programs for children on the move run um, and how you and Child Fund have mitigated them. All right. Thank you so much, Tasha, and thank you to all of the panelists. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and honestly, like speaking from an NGO perspective um, and from the NGO perspective, I feel like mentioning those challenges are something going to be quite common among us all. Um, and so I'm actually very looking forward to the discussion that we will have afterwards in which we can learn from one another how everyone has actually gone through those challenges and how to mitigate them. Um, so they are numerous, of course, as you know, uh, but maybe I've just chosen a few ones um, to go through together. Um, the first one that comes into my mind uh, honestly is the violence in the communities that sometimes not only the children but their families and those who are working with them like the frontline workers and all of the professionals that they actually face um, so this is a huge challenge for us because sometimes this um, violence can cause of course the disruption of the program but it can cause harm to those who are working with the children themselves and so as a duty of care um, we really try to provide the mental health and psychosocial support um, services to the staff members and the frontline workers because in addition to that those frontline workers are already witnessing um, vicarious trauma that is very 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 severe um, to the extent that we've actually seen suicide rates go up higher at, at, at that level um, and so we really need to start addressing such a challenge among them and really addressing oh, oh sorry um, and really addressing the mental health and the psychosocial well-being of uh, professionals and frontline workers and staff members um, so another thing is the of course non-stop ever going social political and natural events as well um, so extreme political events for example that are happening in honduras or ecuador um, or any um, natural disaster we really try to adapt our program strategies when it comes to that uh, we try to respond as rapidly as possible and be quite agile uh, to those rapidly changing conditions um, we st we try at child fund to develop disaster resilient programs for example um, and so on another thing that has been quite difficult um, to achieve despite the fact that we have been mentioning it over and over again and I literally just 
like presented on it. Uh, but it is a challenge that even though we are prioritizing it, it's not easy to achieve, which is the localization. Um, and it's already been mentioned here on the panel, but with localization, um, it is not quite easy within short time specifically as well um, to build those relationships and this trust with the local communities, with the local entities, with the local organizations. Um, so something that we have noticed as a matter of fact is that there are quite misconceptions about faith-based organizations, uh, specifically when it comes to certain like cultural um, or religious practices, for example, given the um, different issues and the very sensitive issues that we work with um, in our sector. But um, we really try to take the time to um, really build this sort of trust um, and change this thought process at the faith-based organizations, for example. And we try to include and um, really demonstrate the respect of the local leaders and the community leaders, uh, collaborating with them. And it actually has proven to be quite effective. And we've started to have them like on our side. Um, so this was, was one way Way of how we try to achieve localization um, at Child Fund. Um, something actually, so Serena's mentioned funding, and funding is a huge challenge, of course. Um, so not only that do we have limited funding with um, Children on the Move and in general um, within the humanitarian crisis, but specifically when we talk about the migration cycle the pre-migration stage which is more of like the preventative stage we have even more and more limited funding opportunities um and so this is something that we really try and and work on finding um we try to as much as we can, at least, to have like um, innovative strategies to quite appear to the um, to the donor sector, for example. Um, one other thing is that as as children on the move, um, we kind of like follow the process or the program implementation up until let's say like for example return. If this is the ultimate um, goal, however, after this cross-border, we don't really conduct much follow-up, even though the community really still needs our support. Um, and so we need funding to continue to do that as well. So this would be another challenge. Um, so we just need all of us, I guess, in this room, and we keep like saying it again, we really need to keep on advocating for this, um, for these funding opportunities, but also think of like innovative ways. So um, international donors, of course, but also maybe like private sector, other organizations, just trying to reach out as much as we can um, as a community of practice. And um, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, one other thing that really touches home, I think, to all of us is, of course, the social norms and the gender biases. Um, now, social norms, particularly around gender biases against young children um, and all of the marginalized communities specifically, is very difficult and it hinders our program implementation. So what we try to do is to follow a gender sensitive and an inclusive approach at our program implementations at Child Fund. Um, we try to really enhance the communities as a whole. So not only, of course, the children where we raise their awareness, but also their families, uh, those who are working with them, the professionals, um, the local stakeholders, the national stakeholders throughout the program implementation process. We really try to have a, um, a gender approach in which we raise awareness and have uh, social behavioral change approaches of, um, as well, um, especially with, for example, issues such as stigmatization and when it only not not only gender wise but also like a social norm of the stigmatization of children upon return uh, because also part of our duty of care or like the do no harm principle we keep asking for the return the return the return but then do we actually think of what happens after the children return and after those families return the stigmatization that they might face for example so this is something also that we really try to consider and think about um, at child fund and address um, as well. 
Um, one, I guess, yeah, one more thing I want to say, uh, talk about is the language barrier. Uh, so we have like a lot of community members who are indigenous, for example, uh, or who speak in other languages than the professionals speak in, so French or Portuguese, for example, and it's not necessarily possible to always have multilingual um, professionals uh, like with us. So we try to think outside the box. We really try to um, implement audiovisual, for example, ways to communicate so we try to use arts and music to communicate um, so there are many universal languages that we can really try to use um, so we try to do that at child fund um, another thing that is quite catastrophic uh, honestly is of course education um, and the disruption of education within community uh, within uh, children on the move um, so sometimes we don't even know when it will be resumed so in Mexico for example uh, by the time they reach sometimes they had already missed about nine months of schooling uh, and education so um, this whole reintegration of school uh, we really try to um, enhance it as much as we can we try to provide some sort of like basic education throughout the journey or their transit we try to utilize the learning passport for example um, during transit and one last thing I just want to say I promise I promise um, is the emerging risks because because, for example, um, as you've mentioned, Tasha, like I work also in online safety, and one of the new emerging risks among children on the move is online violence because the usage of um, digital devices and, and, and the online uh, world it has been increasing, especially with children on the move and their families. So the online risks are you know like uh, concurrently also increasing so this is something that we try um, and raise awareness of us and um, at the organizational level as well to be able to uh, mitigate them as much as we can and thank you tasha thank you thank you very much let's give a round of applause for our panel thank you very much so many good practices, developing programs and partnerships. We want to now open the discussion to all of you and hear from you your reflections, your proposals on the way forward. What is it that the Alliance can also contribute, if anything, in your view, to advancing protection work for children on the move? What is different? What do we need to add? What do we need to elevate and highlight? I open the floor. Who would like to come in? Hi. Um, thank you so much for the great presentations and, and sharing these experiences. Um, I believe, uh, I strongly believe, that this is a good example, but maybe it's important for us to develop a, a mechanism that, that allows us to share best practices in a more quickly, like more effective. Uh, sometimes, for example, in Ecuador, we have a process for the re regularization of an accompanied children and separated children, and also we have a specialized care, care protocol inspired by over, I don't know, 20 or 25 years of experience of many organizations working there. And also, I think that maybe we can find a mechanism to share uh, judicial precedent, uh, because these are key in this uh, development, development of tools or, or, or everything or even policies that we can that we can share um, and also to compel the state to respond more effectively and, and in order to to have a, like a common protection framework to integrate children within the child protection systems i mean sometimes we we forget that we have courts we have rules and maybe we can apply for I don't know, for different uh, situations and also to have these precedents to create a new standards in our countries and maybe sharing this can be something important. Uh, also, I think that maybe um, we have to work and rethink how we are seeing the standards on children on the move protection and children on the move rights at the global scale. Because sometimes we believe that the standards are there and we have, that's, that's the goal, but sometimes we have to check on that. And maybe to see how on the regional levels uh, we have better standards to understand how we can improve the global standards. For instance, uh, we have in, in Latin America, we have the, the advisory opinion 21 uh, from the Inter-American Human Rights Systems that in some cases are 
going forward or, or have better standards um, on the on the ones related to the uh, committee of the children um, children's rights and also on migrants and sometimes we have to see that and maybe try to to to, to enhance this this uh, this precedence so maybe we can share these experiences to have a better common background on this issue wonderful thank you we have another one here and then Paul in the back and I have three questions, and I'm going to ask all of them, and you can choose what you answer. So the first is um, for the first panelists on the child movement through Mexico. I was wondering, um, you said that if children come into contact, then the state is the guardian. But I was curious about how you're interacting with children who are still moving on and or when they come back, um, just kind of logistically speaking. Can they pass through? Are they, um, if they're then in, in residential shelter, can they not continue their journey? Um, and this is somewhat for you, but maybe anyone could speak to. Um, it sounds like the policy change had a big impact on the child protection systems you were able to implement. And I was curious if you could speak more to how that, both how those policy changes happened, but how you've seen, like what role that has played in that. And then this maybe is for everyone. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm curious about how children are able to um, execute agency um, if they want to continue on in a journey um, and if you notice that there are protection risks um, with that journey, how you are handling those. Excellent. Thank you. Let's keep going. Yeah. Through. We're going to come to the panel at the end. So, uh, hi guys, uh, thank you so much, all oh ladies. Thank you so much for your presentation. I think it's, it's been very useful. So I wanted to ask two questions. You know, in terms of child protection, and especially in child protection humanitarian uh, action, one of the biggest criticism we receive as a sector is how to address meaning, the, the gaps in terms of coverage and quality in our interventions. So sometimes we have a great quality, but the, the intervention is in such a small scale. And we don't necessarily have how to scale up quickly without losing uh, the quality. So this is, you know, one. The second one I wanted to, to hear thoughts because obviously this is something that's going on right now is that especially in this region, we have a lot of countries, you know, already advancing or middle income countries and high middle income countries and even countries who are already graduating. When a country, you know, crosses the threshold, we also expect, you know, countries to be able to support their specialized systems and to fund their specialized systems. They will still rely on us to teach them or, you know, to support them and addressing on, on how to do it because we have a lot of civil defense and you know risk management but these people still do not understand really what child protection means and implies so i'd like to hear if you have any good experiences on addressing and leveraging public findings public funding to use and support child protection humanitarian actions initiatives i have four more tasha should we go do all of them thank you very much i'm going to speak in spanish eh, muchas gracias por la, las presentaciones. Quisiera hacer una reflexión muy, muy, muy rápida desde el punto de vista de autoridad que represento en México eh, eh, y, y solo pensar cómo poder aprovechar eh, al máximo posible las capacidades de los diferentes actores, es decir, gobierno con sus limitaciones, sociedad civil con sus capacidades y también sus limitaciones y agencias de la, de la ONU, entre otros actores. El caso mexicano eh, lo vemos desde el principio, eh, limitaciones en términos de la, del diseño de política pública, creo que hay una primera oportunidad ahí, un reto importante, y cuando lo vemos traducido en, en la práctica también eh, estos diferentes intereses que de pronto se presentan en los diferentes actores y no hay una alineación, es decir, muchas veces peleamos y tardamos mucho tiempo por llegar a un objetivo común. ¿Cómo hacer para que incluso desde antes ya tengamos este acuerdo y que, con independencia de que los recursos no fluyan tan rápido y la burocracia a todos nos mate, este, eh, ¿cómo lograr que sí sea consistente? Porque esa es la parte más, más importante. De pronto los esfuerzos no solo gubernamentales se pierden, sino también del resto de los actores. Entonces, me parece que eso es un punto importante. Y el segundo, 
me parece también que es un punto de saber cuáles son nuestros alcances como autoridades y como otros actores, es decir, en dónde sí intervenimos y en dónde no, y, y dónde está el punto de coordinación, de articulación. Eh, nosotros como, como gobierno no podemos hacer muchas veces lo que sociedad civil sí puede hacer con, cap con su capacidad técnica, eh, pero la sociedad civil no se puede sustituir en las funciones gubernamentales en muchos países y ese es un choque tremendo. Entonces, creo que entender los alcances y la gestión y hasta dónde podemos coordinarnos y articularnos todavía sigue siendo un reto grandísimo. Tenemos ahí una práctica ya con las agencias de la ONU en México que nos ha llevado justo a este punto que hemos presentado hoy. Creo que es posible, pero hay muchísimo más que hacer y ese creo que es el reto que nosotros… Bueno, yo quiero dejar sobre la mesa también. ¿no? Muchas gracias. Pues un poco en la línea de lo que nos comentaba Oliver… Eh, dos puntos que yo creo que sí deberíamos de, de poder tener lineamientos concretos, eh, muy operativos y prácticos. ¿no? El, los flujos migratorios eh, son regionales. ¿no? ¿Cómo nos estamos coordinando a nivel regional? ¿Tenemos un mecanismo de coordinación regional para Child Protection? ¿Está respondiendo a las necesidades que tenemos los grupos en las oficinas país, los grupos a nivel sub subnacional? Creo que sí es algo que en la región tenemos que revisar, tenemos que tener una discusión eh, mucho más crítica y constructiva de cómo podemos articularnos, porque estamos trabajando casi todos en lo mismo, entonces sí tenemos muy buenas prácticas y experiencias que, que compartirnos y también eh, ver cómo eh, podemos, eh, pues esto quizás es más complejo, ¿no? pero los casos que tienen alta necesidad de protección, cómo podemos generar esa coordinación transnacional. ¿no? Eso por un lado, y luego por otro, eh, creo que también deberíamos de poder tener eh, estrategias o lineamientos muy concretos para no perder el foco, ¿no? porque todas las acciones que realizamos en Child Protection, también en gestión de casos, ¿no? sobre todo también en gestión de casos, debería de ir a fortalecer a la institucionalidad pública y debería de ir a fortalecer a eh, los sistemas no formales de protección, la comunidad. ¿no? Entonces, muchas veces con nuestras intervenciones desfocadas, digo yo, eh, podemos sí generar la debilidad de la institucionalidad y romper esos círculos de protección que muchas veces puede haber en la comunidad. Entonces, honestamente, eh, tenemos muchísimos materiales a nivel global, pero la realidad es que las capacidades locales en el territorio e inclusive nacionales nos sobrepasan ¿no? a la realidad. Entonces, eh, la realidad nos sobrepasa a todos. ¿no? Eh, no, no podemos responder solos. Por lo tanto, creo que sí es necesario simplificar y poder tener como, pues eso, pocos lineamientos, pero muy efectivos que puedan responder a estas necesidades. So, Tasha, you have about three minutes left, but four more questions, so I don't know if you want to cut it here or... Thank you. Um, a brief comment in line with the other comments from the colleagues that already spoke. Um, I think one of the recommendations, because you asked what can the Alliance support, um, I agree that there should be a platform that where we can have good practices and examples. I think every agency has a lot of good examples and also in coordination with other agencies and local governments, but, um, and I believe some of the good practices are also in the Sustainable Development Goals platform, but maybe something from the Alliance would be great to have. And another recommendation would be for the Alliance to support advocacy with local governments, because from the experience, the good practices that we have seen always involve participation and coordination with local governments. Um, I think between UN agencies, NGOs, great, we can do a lot of good things, but in order for it to be sustainable, it would be important to have the support from local governments. So I think advocacy from the Alliance would be needed for that. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Very rich already contributions. We're gonna run back down the line here please in one sentence to reflect on the proposals, right? The, we're now starting to formulate the takeaway action points already. Um, and so we'll work our way back. Kariga, you spoke last, why don't you speak first and we'll end here with Rocio. One sentence on your takeaway from the recommendations from the group. Starting with you, coming back to Rocio this way, go ahead. Okay, 
Um, yeah, so I think I think most of us have agreed really that the importance of partnership and importance of collaboration um, is something that we can't go without noticing. And especially now that we are here for the first time in person in so long with the Alliance, um, we better really make use of this because if we go without making use of this, then it would really be a disappointment to especially all of the youth advocates who were talking to us during the uh, this week um, who are very inspirational. Um, and I just want to mention one more quote um, on like by another youth advocate who um, I just met in Indonesia a couple of months ago. And she said that we need to disturb the adults and make them uncomfortable. And honestly, like this is really what I've been seeing like with the youth. And I can be like happier and prouder just seeing children telling us what to do because this is really what we really need to be doing. We need to, um, and as the first, um, the keynote speaker said, we need to stop complaining and start acting. Um, so the fact that we're all here together, um, we need to really take things forward um, as um, like best practices and partnerships and collaborations. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Severine. Thank you. Um, so on my side, I feel that we have already a lot of initiatives existing uh, in the region uh, and jointly as well. I mean, uh, you already have coordinations, but you need to use it uh, maybe uh, um, more. Um, so this is what uh, I think. Uh, for me, I, I was surprised with uh, all the, the project that presented. So I feel like we just need to optimize what we have already. And um, yes, we need more capacities, we need more fundings, uh, we need to work better together, and probably we, we can identify what type of tools or guidance could help us to do that uh, with the Alliance. Uh, but I feel that we already have the structure. Yeah, thank you. Marina? Thanks a lot. So in my one minute, I'm trying to address the question, what to do when services are not sufficient, that some, somebody asked. And uh, of course, I don't have the final uh, solution for that. But definitely working with uh, organizations, for instance, refugee-led organizations, where we cannot access to some areas, uh, or working with women-led organizations, we, when we cannot really reach part of the population, this has been demonstrated as very effective. So whenever services are not sufficient and partnership with the institutional actors or with the actors that maybe are in this room, working with other types of uh, partners, specifically the community themselves uh, and passing, uh, passing uh, messages to the communities and building with them uh, responses is proven to be very effective. So my reply would be work with refugee-led organization and community-based organization. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Russia. Thank you. So to achieve a scale, coverage and sustainability, um, then there is a, a, a absolutely need to support the government to strengthen their systems, child protection systems, and their services. Otherwise, we will never reach scale or sustainability. So that at the center. For that, we need partnerships and we need coordination. We need to speak with one voice. With one voice, we manage to achieve policy reforms. It is possible even to end detention. So our collective voice is very powerful. Coordination in practice, in case management. Please bear in mind the legal and policy frameworks on the countries we're working on uh, and what is possible and what is not possible. Use the subclusters, the areas of responsibility to make that happen. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. That's perfect. Thank you very much. We heard for a platform for advocacy and amplifying what's working, building on the good practice. Thank you very much. Please applaud our panel. I mean, that close.